Well, just imagine we have 4,000 4, employees. We have 32 languages. We have all kinds of channels in those languages. We are an independent media house. We have our independent board. We get fundings from the federal government, but they have no way to influence our reporting. It's totally separate. Before we put it online, we have fact-checked it. And that's why we have editors who we train who looked at uh, who look at this text piece, for example, or at this video, yeah. and ask the right questions. What are your sources? Who did you talk to? What are you passionate about? Or perhaps I should ask, what career do you look into pursuing? And are you just in it for the money? If that's your answer, then think again, because today I speak to one of a seasoned editor, seasoned reporter who's reported from almost all over across the globe. Manuela Caspar, the editor-in-chief of Deutsche Welle, popularly known as DW, a media company based in Germany. And I hope you can listen to this and get a little bit more of inspiration. But before I get into that, Manuela Caspar speaks about credibility in journalism, accuracy, and the fact that you need exclusive content if you're thinking about this industry. Besides that, I hope you learned something and you enjoy her story. Manny, nice finally meeting you. <laughs> yeah. I know how nice busy to meet you are. You. Yeah, yeah. So tell me a little bit about your role as editor-in-chief of DW. Well, just imagine we have 4,000 4, employees. We have 32 languages. We have all kinds of channels in those languages. We are on Facebook, we are on TikTok, we are on our own channel, cw.com, uh, of course. We have TV, we have, we have radio. So you can imagine it's a complicated job. It is a complicated job, and you're doing all of that in so many languages. How many languages now? 32 languages, and I speak four languages, but uh, we have people who speak many more languages than I do. You speak how many languages? Four. Four languages? Yeah. Germany? German, English, Russian, and Spanish. German, English, Russian, and Spanish. But we have colleagues who speak Chinese and Russian and Arabic all at the same time, you know? So. Languages, uh, that's certainly something of our skill. It's yeah. a key aspect. Yes. Yeah. What is your major role as the editor-in-chief? Um, the major role is to guarantee the quality of our journalism, to make sure that the quality of our journalism is what we want it to be. When you speak about quality, what exactly are you focusing on? unbiased information, yeah. that we make clear where, what our sources are, that we have people on the ground reporting from the ground. We have many, many correspondents all over the world. This is very important. And that we are in direct contact with them. With them. They file their stories to us and so on. So this is important, that we have exclusive content, that, that we have content that is fact-checked and that is unbiased exclusive, fact-checked, and unbiased. Yes. I'm going to come to that, you know, you know, point by point. Okay. And I'd like to, to know, how do you tell this particular content that you've received is fact, or this particular content that is airing online is not quality? How do well, you fact-check that? Well, hopefully before we put it online, we have fact-checked it. And that's why we have editors who we train, who looked at, uh, who look at this text piece, for example, or at this video, yeah. and ask the right questions. What are your sources? Who did you talk to? Did you ask this person also for a statement? If you haven't done that, please go back, ask for a statement, and so on. What are your findings? How did you get to your findings? And we often have also an extra report just internally for us, what the sources are that were used, where that were used, and so on who quoted what and so on. So it's quite a process. It's quite a process and it's a really tedious process. Absolutely, and yeah. we also make mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. Has there been a particular you know, moment when you made a mistake and it was really costly? 
costly for our reputation. Yes. Every mistake is costly for our uh, reputation because people expect from us quality of journalism, which we deliver normally. But if we make a mistake, say we gave the wrong figure or put it in the wrong context, then we do apologize and uh, apologize, and we are transparent about it. That means we put an editor's note, for example, say yes. we had to correct that fact because it wasn't true, uh, and the right figure is this and that. Unbi or we add a statement. Unbiasedness. How do we ensure that we relay information from both parties without being biased or being seen to be, you know, supporting or more inclined towards one party? Of course, we as journalists, we know how to use our tools, we know our trade, we know what to do. Yeah. And of course, we also have a personal opinion, but we shouldn't let this personal opinion influence our work. Right. That means even if I lean to one side personally, that doesn't have to show in my report. I have to make sure that even though I lean to the side, that the other side is in this report as well. But it's also a question of due diligence. Of course, if you have, a, say, a right-wing person making unfounded allegations, you don't have to give this person the same amount of airtime because it's so untrue, you know that it's untrue, as the other person. So you have to, balance. to find balance, you know? You wait, we call that. Now, Mane, there is a lot of emergence in the markets of new media, and especially bloggers, or rather just social media users, how do we ensure that, you know, we are separated from that, you know, you know, the mainstream media and these alleged bloggers and, you know, social media users? I mean, bloggers, they often have an agenda, of course. They have a personal agenda, which doesn't have to be bad. You know, when you go this blogger, what he or she stands for, that's okay can be one source of information for the normal users. But you also know what differentiates a media house like ours from this blogger. You know we have a long training as journalists. You know we collect different opinions, put it into context, yeah. and we have no agenda. So that's the difference. There's the aspect of exclusivity in quality of yes. the news that you you know yes. you broadcast to your clients as yeah. DW, how do you ensure exclusivity? Uh, for example, with our correspondence, yes. it's it's not sufficient to sit at your desk, get the information from the agencies, and write a report. I mean, anybody can do this. It's yeah. not so difficult. And in 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 times of artificial intelligence, which we have now. If you want to differentiate yourself, you have to be on the ground. You have to talk to the people on the ground. Get first-hand information. Yeah, yeah. first-hand information. Yeah. Deliver this first-hand information, this extra information, which you, no artificial intelligence can give you. Uh, and that's so important, you know. And that's what we, try. we have uh, are building our correspondence network, which is already very big. And we are investing in that as well. I would like us to talk a little bit about independence of media. You know, you hear countries speak about we've given our media independence globally. And from where you sit at being in Germany and, you know, managing such a big team, working for such a reputable media house, what would you have to say about where we are at globally when it comes to media independence? It's getting more and more difficult to stay independent. One has to admit that. Because in private media, of course, the ones who are buying private media or investing there, they often want that their own opinion is shown on this media. Yeah. They, they invest because they want to have a voice for their ideas. And so um, for private media, it's more difficult, but also for public media. Because public media nowadays comes more under scrutiny. They say, are you really independent? Or don't you have your own agenda? Yes. Or why do you criticize the government because the government is so perfect in our eyes? So uh, also public media comes under more, more scrutiny. Yes. Uh, and now that you spoke about public media money, I would like to know from where you sit. How do you not, you know, seem to work like you're truly, you know, accepting or rather agreeing with the, what the government is saying, even when you know pretty good 
that the government is wrong in some instances. How are you able to relay that information, for example? Um, the government is for us also just one voice. Yes. And not the voice we, one voice we include if it is necessary for the kind of report we are doing. Yes. Or we don't include, you know. We don't want to be conform with the government. We are not the government. We are an independent media house. We have our independent board. We get fundings from the federal uh, government, but they have no way to influence our reporting. It's totally separate. That is beautiful. It's a complicated construction. It's yes. similar to the BBC World Service. Yes. Uh, but so they can't say you have to do this report or that report. Otherwise, you know, our journalists wouldn't work here for sure. Great. Talking about you have to do this report and you don't have to do this report. Earlier on during our conversation, when you're giving us a brief address, you know, we spoke a lot, of, a lot about the risks, you know, that journalists have gone through when, you know, in their line of duty. Yes. And I would like to know, there's the risk bit of it that you receive once the story has gone on air. How do you deal with that story, knowing very well that you're going to receive negative reactions and, you know, all these reactions may affect the media house and also the journalists? You know, unfortunately, this happens nearly every day. Yeah. These kind of threats our journalists get on social media accounts, for example, that is like the, the most simple step. This happens every day. They are accused for their reporting. They are insulted. They are threatened. They know how to deal with that. If it gets really bad, then we have to talk to our security uh, uh, team and they look if we have to take certain measures. measures That's one yeah. thing. Yeah. But it gets more difficult if you report from a country where there is an autocratic regime which exercises power and threatens you with prison or, or taking your passport away or threatens your family. This also happens to our journalists, not every day, but it happens unfortunately on a regular basis. And then we have to see what we can do to support our colleagues. We evacuate them from the country where they are threatened, or we help them with their family. We move them to other locations until the storm dies down. All kinds of measures we, we, we put into place. Yeah. And that's unfortunately something I, as an editor-in-chief, more and more often have to deal with nowadays. Yeah, you know, it's unbelievable that you'd, you'd be speaking about that in a country like Germany because also there's the perception about these kind of things and threats happening only in small and developing countries. But then from your angle and where you sit at, it's quite unfortunate that still we hope that we can get that, you know, um, safety as journalists to be in a global space. But then perhaps it's going to take us a while, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So sp speak to me about you know, the, the aspect of there is this story that is coming to air. And so this story has a lot of interest, perhaps politically or you know, socially or whatever. And they know that the story is going to be airing soon. So they're trying to kill the story so that the story cannot go on air. Have you faced such like cases before? Um. Yes, that's why we are very secretive about the stories, if, if it is an investigative story, for yeah, example, yes. uh, with giving out any information beforehand. And we ask the ones which are playing a role in this investigative stories for a comment only shortly before it's being published, yeah, a few hours or, or two days before, yes. so that they can't take any measures. You know, so that's how we proceed with it. But when we are checked all the sources and that we are absolutely convinced the stories should go on air, then we publish it, despite all the trouble we get afterwards, you know. Uh, and then we sometimes, you know, probably it was the right story. That's why everybody is so excited about it, yes, you know. Yes. Thank you. I, I like your perspective on that. A little bit about what is going on globally around the world. Everybody knows about the war that is going on, you know, between Israel and uh, Palestine, if I have to mention that. And what is it you'd mention from where you sit are the challenges that you faced reporting on that particular crisis? 
on this uh, crisis, uh, it's very difficult to get independent information. For example, in Gaza, there are not many journalists nowadays, and the journalists who work there are in difficult uh, situation as well. Yes. And you can't double check sources often. So, the information you receive. Yeah, you the receive. information we receive, we can't double check always and so on, so that's problematic. So if we put something out, we have to name the source at least. This and that organization said this and that, or how many victims are in a certain attack and so on. Uh, so it, it's hard work and uh, f from both sides, you know. But also we, we have our colleagues in, in Lebanon, we have some colleagues who work with in Gaza, but also uh, colleagues in Israel. So we try to get the full pictures and deliver context. You know, not just say, this happened, that happened, this happened, deliver context. Why is this happening? Yeah. Why is this organization uh, answering like that and so on, or, or this government? Yeah. That, that, is, that is really tricky. What would you say from where you sit at? I'm really pointing at you from where you sit at because you've been in this industry for so many years. Yes, that's yeah. true. <laughs> so you have a wealth of experience, yeah. and especially you know working for a media house as big as DW with correspondents all over the world. So that's why I'm coming to you again as an individual to paint me a picture. What are the biggest challenges that you foresee journalists facing? You know in the most recent years that you think we may need a lot of time to really put things into place? Well, the, the biggest threat is, of course, the threat to press freedom. Yes. Uh, uh, many regimes don't like press freedom. They don't like to be criticized when it's... They should be criticized yes. for the actions they're taking. Yes. The other thing is the rise of artificial intelligence, intelligence. and being able to differentiate what is true and what is false. Is that what I see, reality, or was it manipulated? And the AI fake, fakes are getting better and better so, better, so it's more, more difficult to differentiate what is true and what is false. And so we have to kind of enable our audience to show them what to look for, out for to be able to identify. And we as journalists have to learn also how to use tools to check fakes and deep, deep fakes as well. A little bit, Mane, you know, just to break the monotony, a little bit about your personal life. Yes. Yeah. I'm aware you've been to how many countries right now as we speak? <laughs> you don't there are, few, there are very few countries where I haven't been, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You, I, I, if I were you, I would be counting. No. <laughs> I stopped counting, no. But no. what is it that you love about your job so much? Uh, I love the diversity of our culture. I love to work in an environment with so many diverse cultures, experiences. Uh, I love to work with our correspondents and I love to yeah, to work for the truth, yeah. What has got you sticking around for so many years? Because as you mentioned yourself, there's a lot of press misfreedom, yes. to be fair. Yes. Yeah. yes, And there's lots of risks being in the industry, yeah. What do you have to say has got you to stick around? Because there are so many risks anyway. Why do you have to keep going? You can have a different career. <laughs> 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 yeah. I have a passion for journalism and I have a passion for the truth and I love people, you know, it's all about people. Some topics sound so abstract in the end, it's all about people, that's my motto. How are your three kids doing? And tell me, is it all boys? Is it all girls? What's that? One boy, two, two girls uh -huh. and they are doing very well. They have different career paths but we are quite a big family and love each other and I'm very happy. Yeah. How have you combined the English aspect and the German aspect? Well, they are all bilingual, of course, and uh, they have been trained on uh, English-speaking schools, even though they live in Germany. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, they are fluent in English, of course. Great. What advice would you give to, you know, anyone considering journalism as a career from your experience? Don't expect too much money, but expect how can I say, a purpose. Yeah, if you have a purpose, then do what you want to do. And that's what I often notice with the young people who are applying for jobs. 
at Deutsche Welle for our volunteership, for example, or traineeship, they want to change things. They want to inform. They love the diverse culture. Yes. And they don't care for money. Of course, you need money, but it's not. They don't want to become rich. Money shouldn't be the goal. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Passion should be. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you for that. I brought you a little bit of a gift from Nairobi, Kenya, because I understand how terrible your summer is. <laughs> That's <laughs> all. And, and, and you can I agree cold. with me. <laughs> <laughs> Last year was better. <laughs> Last year was better. This year is terrible. I'm hoping you're gonna have a few nicer days. You know, when you can so go I. out and just so enjoy. So do I. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So I brought you a little bit of something from Nairobi, okay, and I'd like, this? yeah, it's a hoodie, and I'd like that you fit. Okay. Sorry. Then, Sorry. Then I have to take my glasses off. Yeah, your glasses Otherwise. off. You can just <laughs> sit okay, on them. Okay. You can sit down. Okay. Yeah. I put them here. Oh, you could have given them to me. <laughs> you may have to take your jacket off. I can okay. hold that for That's you. It's okay. You are a whole editor in chief. <laughs> I have to do everything on my own, you know. <laughs> okay. So, what's written on there? Okay. Oh, so basically, that's the name of you know our TV. Okay. And the name of the show. Yeah, so there you go. Nice. Yeah, good for the weather, right? <laughs> nice. <and warm. laughs> I'm glad you love it. Okay. <laughs> Thanks so much for your time. Thank you yeah. as well. Yeah. So that ah, will nice. keep you during this, you know, terrible weather on your casual days. Yeah, you know. I'm happy now. Yeah, okay. you're happy now. <laughs> You can see what it ma why it matters to have media freedom and also the freedom of expression as a journalist. But besides that, you need to have patience and know that you're working for passion and not just the money from our conversation with her. And I hope you learned something from the show today. Many thanks for watching the show. And I hope you can catch me again next Saturday at 8.30 p.m. only on KTN News. And if you have a story you'd like to share, please don't hesitate. Write to us through globetraction at standardmedia.co.ke or DM us on our social media platforms at globetraction or at KTN News KE. You can also tap that follow button to me on my social media platforms at Fasil Selewa on Facebook, Instagram, X, TikTok, and YouTube for more of behind the scenes and many other amazing stories. But until then, danke from Germany.